We are live in three, two, one. Not yet. No, we're live. It says recording for me. Oh, really? What's up, everybody? How we doing? Welcome to the Salient Project. It's I Alexi and Alec. I, we are your hosts, Alec Cosio yeah. Altamirano and Alexi Cortez. Um, so far, we've been talking about a lot of topics recently. Um, we finished last week's conversation with our scorecard. Uh, we've been talking a lot about identity, about the benefits of identity, about the benefits of knowing um, top-down versus bottom-up uh, salience. Uh, we can go over a little bit of that. Um, and most importantly, you know, we've just been here experimenting with ourselves, our bodies, our own lives, um, and just kind of enjoying the process um, of becoming better versions of ourselves. Uh, so, Lex, did you employ the scorecard protocol this past week? Um, yeah, I did. Now, it, it was, I wasn't as consistent as I would have liked to have been, but I was at the same time. Do um, you want to just go over the protocols quickly so that they know? Yeah, so what do we got? We got focus, breathing for 10 minutes. With? Two to, yeah, go with, ahead. Go ahead, with, no, we, uh, with intention setting or positive affirmations yeah, with, about identity. About identity. Um, the whole purpose of all this is to help us get more in tune with who we are and uh, get closer to finding our true identity. Um, and then so two to ten minutes of light viewing, sunrise and sunset um, just helps set, set the circadian clock, which we've discussed before. And we'll actually discuss a paper here in a little bit. Um, up to one hour of no technology. Now, originally, we discussed if that should be in the morning or the night. And then after Alec and I discussed it um, prior, or post last podcast, um, we decided that just it's spending at least one hour at any part of the day without your phone is, uh, is what we're kind of looking for. It doesn't have to be first thing in the morning or first thing at night. But uh, just beginning to detach yourself from technology, from um, exterior stimulus, yeah, um, which is all stimulus, I guess. So just not this constant context switching that we are so used to with our computers and social media. Just getting away from that and getting into more deep work or focusing on um, whatever it is you you try to in meditation, learning, work, exercise. Just giving, um, yeah, you giving do? yourself time to like be with you, like you be, be with, with you. you. Um, yeah, not, not times. Have, like, yeah, not have like technology grabbing at your attention or you know things just taking you away from you being in that moment. Um, and then the last one was uh, what a journal entry. Um, an interoceptive journal entry, and the only requirements for that was a date, a team, theme or topic, and then just one sentence or it could be a page. Um, I actually liked doing the journal entries because it was helping me process a lot of like the things that were happening throughout my day, um, whether they were good or bad. Um, it was so you so did it at the end of the day or middle of the day? I did mine at the end of the day. So that was, so, so, it was yeah. funny. Because I would wake up and I would purposely try to create like a routine where I would wake up immediately. I would just go right outside to get my light viewing um, and I would leave my phone in my room and I would take a 10 minute walk, like one walk around my block with my dog um, for 10 minutes. And while I was on my walk, I was focusing on my breathing and setting my intentions for the day and away from technology and getting my light viewing. So I was getting all of my cortisol release <clears throat> and making sure that I was getting the proper photons in my eyes um, to set my body up for the day. And I would wake up, or sorry, I would come back in and it was just like, really just like- be woken up. Yeah, it would just be like easing into the day. Like I didn't feel rushed, I was calm, I was relaxed. I was, you know, everything was like, at ease and it kind of was a bit different from what I'm used to where like I'm on my phone or I'm texting somebody or I'm calling somebody or I'm trying to set up meetings or I'm trying to like, you know, race yeah, to right, the, right the, away. Yeah. Yeah. Race to do that. It was like every, no time at all. Yeah. It was like, everything was like, 
like like easing into the day and it made things a lot more like easy going and then towards the end of the day is when i would do all of my introspective journaling about things that stood out to me during the day um one example of that was i was playing pickup soccer and there was actually a conflict on the field and i was super like bothered about it and then i just like wrote about it and just like shut it and closed my eyes did my prayers closed my eyes and that was that and it allowed me to like reflect on it without having to carry it with me you That's know true. So yeah. it was, it was, i was actually a really cool protocol and uh i like that I, I enjoyed it a lot i enjoyed it a lot and i think uh i didn't do today because i went to the gym with a friend because it was like raining all day all morning so kind of like threw things off but for the other days i've been pretty consistent about it i think i missed maybe sunday and that was it yeah um like so i've been i've been keeping like some some metrics like that in my journal for a while so it's like i i have a a kind of set routine in the morning where i'll wake up i'll kind of just like slowly let myself get up. It might take like five or 10 minutes. Like I'm not out of bed. I'm not jumping out of bed, you know, like I lay there, maybe close my eyes a little bit and just like start thinking about what I have to do for the day. And, um, I mean, I leave the blinds open in my room so that the light can start to shine in in the morning. And that's what kind of gets me woken up. And then, uh, once I feel good enough to get up, I'll wake up, um, I make my bed. That's the first thing I do is make my bed. Like, I don't, I don't, I'll, I'll go to the bathroom first. Then I come back, then I'll make my bed. Um, and then I'll make, I'll make my cough. My, uh, I've been drinking yerba mate lately. So I'll make my yerba mate in the morning and then I'll head outside. And some, like if I'm working, if I have a session at eight in the morning, then uh, I'll do my light viewing as soon as I get there. It's like, so I'll get there, I'll open the facility up, or I'll get here, and then um, I'll go sit outside and do my journal entry. So I like to journal in the morning and at night, and I've been noticing that I do when I do my interoceptive journal entry in the morning, it's about what was happening to me the day before. And after I've gotten a night of sleep on it, it's a little clearer, and I can think about it a little bit more and have like a little bit different perspective than when I was in the moment of whatever I was feeling. And um, I've liked that that way of reflection um, for myself. I've never really – I mean, I do – I guess when you journal, it's all interoceptive at some point, you know, or at some length. And uh, I do journal at night, but usually it's uh, it's not as – clear or defined in terms of what I was thinking when I do wake up the day the next day like if I was feeling rather emotional about something then when I wake up the next day and I go to write about it or think about it it's a more objective viewpoint of it mm -hmm. or subjective whatever that whatever word you would use objective there. I think objective um, viewpoint of it with with the emotions taken a little bit out and a more logical view on it um, which, which I kind of like, yeah. You know, Cause uh, I think too many of us live by our emotions and let our emotions dictate how we think, how we feel, um, and we are not our emotions. You know, our emotions are just a part of us. You know, absolutely. Thing. They're just our nervous system at work. <laughs> They're just our our body. Our our, us, our bodies our at work. Honestly, like I, yeah. I, it's been hitting me a lot recently. Like. The more I understand of my body, the more I realize that it's just a sensory node. And a lot of it is actually removed from who I am. You know, it, it is who I am in this physical world. But it's not who I am in total. And so it's been it's been an interesting um, realization, like kind of peeking through the looking glass and the kaleidoscope of interpersonal work um, that I have to do on my own. And it's been very beneficial for me, at least to be able to, you know, have these protocols so that I can remain in, in more, um, 
I don't want to say fully delta wave or theta wave states, but definitely like more low wave frequencies where I'm not as like in alert fight or flight, you know, person or sorry, sympathetic, like. Yeah, and you know, I like state. I like the way Andrew Huberman described it in one of his episodes where he was talking about this flight or flight fight or flight response, and it's it's extremely vital in survival, you know, but. In terms of like how we interact with society today in sports, we want to be able to, um, I guess, disassociate the brain and the body, right? So the brain has its own fight or flight response, you can think of it, and the body has its own fight or flight response. Now, most people, when the body go, hits the fight or flight response, so does the brain. But we can learn to keep the mind calm and let the body be alert, right? And that's something like if you think about like plunging into an ice bath where like, you know, you get in and you, your body's like, and you can feel your brain also and you hold your breath and you're like super like, but you can, once you've done it a lot, you can realize that you can focus on your breathing while your body stays in that tense, that that alert situation and like yeah that is what definitely employ top-down control you know and that's what performing at a high level i like especially in sport or anything really and um and reacting emotionally is like your body will go through that fight or flight response because it's it needs to react but if you can keep your mind calm in situations where it does want to go kind of more alert focus if you can keep it calmer then you should be able to have a better decision making process and a lot less emotional reaction towards things and Absolutely. a lot less i guess panic is the what is what i use with my kids you know i always try to tell them be composed and like that's essentially what we're talking about where it's like when somebody's putting pressure on you and you want to panic can you resist that urge to panic in your mind your body's going to like be tense and ready to react but can you keep your mind calm so you can have the best possible reaction which sometimes it is you know it is going in for a tackle and other times it is moving out of the way with the ball and just kind of slicing and dicing yeah you know for sure um <laughs> yeah so, so good good no you got it you got it no, I, I mean, I really found it interesting. Um, now, wrapping into the identity piece, when you did your focused breathing, did you ever, like, come up with anything or any affirmations or intentions, um, whether it was for that day or, like, for your character? Um, I know I did, and I'll speak on those in a minute, but I was just curious. Um, I think one of my biggest intentions when I breathe, like, a, a lot of the reasons why, I'll do more focused breathing in a day than other days is like if I'm not if I'm not feeling like I'm in the state I want to be in, you know. So if I'm not feeling alert when I want to be alert, then I'll do more breathing. Or if I'm feeling too alert when I want to be calm and relaxed, then I'll focus on a different style of breathing. And then so I guess the intention I always set is that I will not let the state that I'm in currently – dictate my performance for the day right and it's like i will try i guess my intention is that i will find a way to put myself in the state that i need to be in in order to maximize whatever it is i'm trying to maximize and that's like a relaxation state you know like i find it really hard to just take time away and watch like a movie or like you know just truly relax because i feel like i need to be doing something always and like you need those states and uh, and th those times for in those kind of moments for yourself um and being able to focus on your breathing make sure you relax you know longer inhales you know longer exhales uh, just to reach that calm state where it's like dude just take a chill minute take a chill pill for a minute like sit down you don't have to always be doing something um and so i find myself it's hard to get into that relaxed state and then other times, like, it's hard to – where we were talking about last time where it's, like, I feel like I'm dragging myself to my sessions sometimes. <clears throat> and I've, my intention whenever I'm – with any of the things on the scorecard, the intention behind it is to prepare myself to be ready to give my best in whatever state that I need to be in and with whatever state I need to be in. Absolutely. And I do think that, like, 
you know, employing top down protocols. So again, like things like motivation, determination, um, focus, uh, things that we can control in our minds. I do, I do really think that it can be beneficial and through like pushing through those, um, those roadblocks that we have internally, or, you know, being able to motivate yourself or fire yourself up for that next session that's coming. Cause you know, you need to bring that energy. Um, I, I really do think that top down did like just internal will, if people applied it more, they would be able to like push through and, and have that extra oomph sometimes. And then sometimes, you know, you, you get into a state of flow where you don't need that. Like I, I know there's some days where, you know, I can feel the energy moving around me, like in whether I'm training my, my team or whether I'm training myself. And, and it's just like, I don't have to give it an extra boost. Like I'm already in that state. And so, you know, recognizing when you're in that moment, and then when you have to push to enter that moment, I think is, can be very beneficial. Um, and the more you do that, the more you'll be, build a relationship with that internal voice of like, you know, where are we now? How are we doing? Things like that. And checking back into that feedback mechanism to make it more bottom up, um, which I think is really, really cool eventually, you know? Uh, yeah, no. And, and, and it's, it's got to be, I think when you start with, you start with the top, top down approach you know it opens up the idea of or not opens up the idea but just like opens your mind up to more things to pay attention to so you can start to begin the bottom up right so it's like top down helps you see what is in the bottom a little bit better so that way you can now then reverse it and go bottom up and kind of keep it in a loop and you're always you know coming back to it because yeah. like because I've I've been tracking things maybe a little bit longer um, than you, and then so as I've been like I started with something really simple, um, and then as I keep tracking and I'm seeing how much benefit it's bringing me, I want to track more things. So like recently I've been tracking like energy level, and I just I just put energy level AM lunch and and evening, and then I'll just put like neutral, good or bad, like or high or low. You know, and then that way now I can start seeing where I'm at each day at, you know, at what time. Okay, what did I do? What was I doing the day before? What was I doing the night before? Well, where was my mind at? What was I thinking yeah. about? Um, and it it never started that way because if I feel like if I looked at it, if I look at what I'm tracking now, a year ago, I'd be like, holy crap, I'd never be able to do that. You know, <laughs> but it, 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 start, it started with like one or two simple things that I believed would really help me. And then they started really helping me tracking those things. And then I was like, okay, I can add more, add more. Then we added the scorecard. And, and then now it's like, now I'm seeing even more. And I'm like, man, like I want to just track everything almost. That I do. <laughs> yeah. You know, one human, piece you know, of but, and, and it's, and it's because I believe, I believe that it will help, <laughs> me, you know, and because I believe it will help me, it makes me more likely to do it. And, it's kind of that placebo effect kind of thing where it's like it, and the power of belief where it's like, just because I believe it will help me, I'm going to do it. I'm more likely to, to stay um, on top of it. Cause there's Absolutely. days where I don't want to write in it, but it's like, then I think about, well, I would like to be able to look a week from now, look back and see how I felt. So I should write it down, you know? So that way in the future I can look back. Absolutely. And, I will say though, like for, for a long time, when I would go to the gym, I was very like top down approach. So like I would have my workout planned out, like I would go in and, you know, know the sets that I was having to do with certain weights and like check them off kind of like we did in college. And then now like I go to the gym and it's totally bottom up. It's like, how are we feeling today? I like, like, what's the protocol going to be? I like, like, and then I'm always like experimenting with new things. Um, for instance, I was talking to you today earlier, like we, uh, I was learning about like growth hormone and how growth hormone is released when the body temperature goes up. And so in order to start my workout, I now have to do a warm up that increases the body temperature and like a, sh a really quick, uh, shortcut to that is just like jumping in the sauna. So yeah. like now I just jump in the sauna for 10 minutes just to get my body temperature up. And now I'm doing like stretches or like mobility and or different things injury prevention 
to where now it's like, cool, I have my warm up done. And then now my gym sessions are like really bottom up. And it's, it's actually quite fascinating and interesting that my body now knows like, hey, today I'm doing deadlifts and bench and pull ups and yada, yada, yada. You know, the list goes on. Are you sitting in the sauna before every session now or just like on ones that you are that you typically feel like doing it or or is it like on the heavy days that you're every doing every lifting, day really? that I've been going to the gym I've been sitting in the sauna um, and it's just really to get my body temperature up it's really nothing more than that it's not to sweat yeah. or like to do anything yeah, yeah. it's just to spike that body temperature rise my and then that like signals to my body hey it's time to prepare like get ready to go and that yeah, kind well, of the muscles get turned on right the muscles get in tune and i'm probably listening to music that's like putting me in a state of like go mode and you know i'm feeling it and then that sweat comes and it's like probably like five minutes and then i'm done and i'm out and i'm in hitting my sets you know whether it's deadlift or the compound movements or olympic lifts whatever um, yeah, so a term, a term like when you when you're talking about all this, a term that comes to mind, and we talked about it a little bit in one of my exercise science classes when I was doing my masters, and they were talking about like auto regulation training, which is essentially what you're talking about, where it's like you go into the gym and you have a an idea of what you want to do, what you want to work out, but based on how you feel, on your energy level, on your soreness, on the what you have in the next couple of days, what you've been doing the previous couple of days, that kind of all comes into what you, how you work out and like how hard you go in your RPE. And, um, I mean, I kind of pay attention to this guy was going on. Cause it was, it was like a discussion before, after class, um, about it. We didn't really hit too much on it during class, but I remember, um, uh, somebody talked about how like th- it's, there's data that's starting to show that this is a better way to train, to keep adherence, you know, to keep people wanting to go to the gym, to keep people wanting to keep going where it's like, where they don't always have to stick to the protocol or the program that's, that's laid out for them that they can kind of buffer it. And um, I think that's what gets me into the gym more often. Cause like for me on my heavy day last week, I did like 185 by five for five reps for three sets and then this week i went in and my first one i did three and i was like holy crap this is so hard so i only i only stayed at three i didn't go up to five and but i still did three rep or three sets and like i auto regulated like i i was like okay i could probably get two more but like what would that how much detriment would that bring me over like gain and adaptation and when we talk about minimum effective stimulus, which I don't know if we've mentioned it here, I know you and I have talked about it a little bit, but when we mention minimum effective stimulus, like I, be- I believe like something like 185 by three compared to 185 by, 185 by five really isn't going to make the biggest difference in terms of my power output for a chest pass if I was a basketball yeah. player yeah, or exactly. for a sprint, you know, but it key it, it, I still get a good work in. I'm I'm maintaining, if not growing, you know. I'm and I'm still getting in and doing things that are going to be pro adaptive for my body. But I'm auto regulating where it's like, because I if you would have asked me to do 185 by five, and it's like you can't do anything else other than that, I would have said no. I don't want to do it, you know. Right. Like, and I, I, because I, I allowed myself to do three. I was like, yeah, I'll knock all three sets out, you know? Yeah. Easily. And I, I definitely think that that comes back to this, like building an understanding of like a better relationship with yourself and not having the guilt or the ego or the things attached to that identity piece where it's like you're, if you were going in with ego and like some dudes doing like 185 by five next to you, you're going to feel the need to push. And this is like, nah, like I'm in my own lane. Alexi's living his own life. He knows how his body needs to feel, and he's kind of auto-regulating the that that state. And I think that that's more important than going in like pushing through and you know whatever. Um, but going back to what I was talking about with the breathing, so when I was doing my focused breathing, uh, I was doing a lot of positive affirmations about myself, um, and it really just helped me like get into a state where 
you know, I was moving more confidently through my day and I was able to, you know, approach things more uh, professionally or more in a, I don't know, in an ethical way. Uh, for example, like, I hope that, I mean, <laughs> well, I guess we'll publish these one day and this, this will come out. But um, so I got a, a job offer to coach uh, a high school, a private school here. And they were offering me like way less money than what I should be offered. Um, just for like my personal value and because I was going through these, you know, affirmations and like understanding like old me would have been like, oh yeah, it's less money, but I kind of want the gig. So I'll take it. And then this version of me was like, but wait, like you're all these things. Like you need to make sure that whatever they're going to, whatever you're going to offer with time and experience and knowledge and passion, they're going to match you in dollars um, because that's the world that we live in. And so I actually put together a long email with a bunch of references and gathered up a bunch of, you know, personal references, references from the school, things like that. And basically just built like an argument as to like why I should be getting paid X instead of Y. And they came back with a counter offer and matched me for X. And that was like, whoa, like all of that was possible because like I had the confidence in myself to know what I was worth and to know my value and to like know my identity and to know that I'm asking for this, not because I want more money, but I'm asking for this because this is the value that I'm going to provide. And I know what that price tag is. Yeah. That makes sense. Like yeah, for yeah. Example, if I was going to, I don't know, lay some bricks in, in a lady's house, like I know I can lay the bricks, but I'm not the best bricklayer. So I'm not going to charge her what an experienced bricklayer would, would, would charge. Yeah. Right, I'm gonna try for me. that level. Yeah, that's true. I like that. You know what um, I'm saying? Like, yeah, and you got to demand your value. You know, when it's there, and if you if you're the type of person that doesn't feel like your value is there for the position that you're reaching, then <clears throat> maybe you do have to take like a pay cut so you can get that experience. So you can't right. like you know. So and you have to learn to balance that. And without <clears throat> proper interoception, you could you wouldn't be able to decide like is this an opportunity that's a little bit out of my league that maybe I should take the money and, that they're offering and I'll learn so much more and gain so, gain so much more for my future endeavors or is my value already there? And it, it, can I offer these things that are worth this value? And without the proper interoception, I don't think you'd be able to get to that conclusion. Absolutely. Yeah. And it was, it was really, <clears throat> it was really a, a highlight for me because I, I reflected on the person that I was before, like maybe five, six years ago. And I know the decision that I would have made. And now when I was sitting down with myself and like breathing through these moments, like I know what I had to do. And even though for me, it wasn't anything for like, it wasn't pride or anything like that. It was just like, you know, you have to make sure that your value is matched. And it was kind of like, Hey, you know, present an argument or not, not present an argument because it's not really an argument, but present like reasons why. And I was able to gather up all these references from people that I had trained, coaches that I've worked with, um, you know, facilities that I've trained at, et cetera, et cetera, that were going to back me up. And I was like, look at that. Like, this is all the reasons why. Like, this is why you can ask for that. If I didn't have any of that and I'm just sending them back an email, like, Hey, that's good, but can we try this? Then I'm They're not, not going to yeah, yeah. evidence as to why. And the I fact think that you took your time to accumulate all that information and make it succinct and send it to them shows a lot. One, and then the fact that the information backs it up as well. It's not like you just like because it, it's not fluff. That yeah, all, you know, and that, it's and like and legitimate. That. It's legitimate. The awards and acknowledgements that you've gotten and references and yeah um, and, it, and, it, and it really did like come to me in a in a place where i was just sitting down breathing being with myself because i knew i had to address it today and i knew that it was going to be something that i had to do so i was really giving myself time and space to like think about it appropriately and i was able to come up with this plan and i did it and i got what i was asking for so it was like really successful and it was kind of an instantaneous feedback that like yo this thing works like keep doing it because it's going to help you make better decisions it's going to help you build 
more confidence in your identity. It's going to help you build more resilience when you have obstacles. Um, and it's going to make things a lot easier because, you know, when you do have those roadblocks, you're not going to have plans of action. You're not going to have experience points. You're not going to have understanding of like the type of person that you are and then how that person is going to handle the situation. Pretty powerful stuff. All right. So Later. let's, let's, um, let's go into the studies that we went and found. Yeah. So let's talk about the focus ones. Yeah. But uh, okay. So this segues perfectly into what we were discussing. So Alexi and I, and the Salience Project, we've been coming up with the importance of identity, how that plays a role in your life, um, how that plays a role in, again, like how you handle things. And we came up with the scorecards uh, that would help us kind of balance and find more of a homeostasis state uh, where we can be at peace with ourselves and in our own skin and making better decisions in life and et cetera, et cetera. And kind of coattailing on the past, the previous story that I just told we wanted to provide you with some evidence as to why we think these bits of the scorecard are important and some studies that actually back up uh, the reasons why we want to do that. So that being said, Mr. Cortez. So um, I'll talk about the study that was on elementary school children. And so basically what they did was they took – a bunch of kids in fifth, fifth and sixth Wait, grade, I believe. Before you go there, though, which protocol is this talking about so they know? This is for focus. Okay, focus breathing, um, focusing on your breathing, the, inter the interoception that we're trying to create, um, and how it, it serves to benefit you and your and anybody else that would um, decide to practice something like this. Okay, and then so this study basically took. Um, a group of kids, I'm trying to find it again. Okay, here we go. A group of kids um, that they, they tested their attention in five different categories. And that would be. Um, it was like, it was like focused, focused attention, attention sustained attention. attention, selective attention, alternating attention, and divided attention. Okay, and. Um, it, it took, it basically took a pretest and a post test. There was a control group and a experimental group. The experimental group was asked to do 20 minutes of this focus training, um, that we will go into. And then, and right after that, they would do a static training session of focused attention. And then, so for the, the dynamic training is what they called it. They would have them do things where they would stare at a wall and make sure that they would ha be focused on a fixed point on the wall in front of them for tw about 20 minutes. And then they would have them do several actions, one through 10, um, one being throw both hands backwards while standing on the toes and slightly tilt the head backwards, but keep attention on the heart. All right, so they're asking the kid to stare at the wall, focus on a fixed point, and then they're having them do some type of movement, whether it's kick two legs forward and alternation and maintain balance and, and keep attention on the waist. Or like the previous one I said, where they're keeping attention on the heart. Um, this interoception that they're, ask, that they're forcing or asking these students to participate in, um, along with static focus training where they invited the students to sit down cross-legged their hands should be placed on their knees their back should be straight and their eyes should be shut lightly um that they were they asked the students to breathe naturally and then once the breathing was stabilized they would request them to focus their attention on different body parts according to the teacher's instruction the sequence of focus was the heart stomach perineum, claudial vertebrae, lumbar vertebrae, cervical vertebrae, vertex between the eyes and the throat. Um, and that's the static focus training. And then so through these 20-minute sessions or so, um, what they found was that two forms of attention, which were, I want to... Focused and selected. Which were focused and selected, were 
improved significantly over the control group. Um, Side and, note. Go ahead. Focused attention is attention that is coming from an external stimuli. So like attention would be auditory or with my eyes, visual, or it could be sensory with my nose. Um, but it's my attention is being grabbed and focused on a something stimuli outside of me. And then selective attention, which is the other side of the study that they were looking for, is more interoceptive attention. So while I see the tree outside my window, I can also feel where my belly button is. Um, and so yep. they were having those students in those activities focus on an external stimuli on the wall while also maintaining focus on a specific part of the body and doing these mo mobile actions at the same time. So go ahead, Lex. Exactly. Um, and then so... I mean, they, the results, the conclusions were that um, after 12-week focus training activities, the experimental group exhibited more favorable performance in all three examined indicators, most importantly or namely focused attention, selective attention, and the total scale as a whole. Um, participants who underwent training also noted that training helped them fall asleep and relax the body. So this study, basically what we want people to understand from this is that when you take a, an, a, an amount of time, and this study is approximately 20 minutes, I've heard 17 minutes from um, Andrew Huberman, um, where, and you deliberately focus on interocepting it, it, where it's, you're thinking about specific body parts, you're thinking about your breath, your heart, and you take this this meditation, this time of meditation, um, even though it's a little bit different, this non-sleep deep rest, it can really help you focus in other areas of your life, whether it's for work or for time with your family or for time with friends. Um, it, it really helps us in a time of constant context switching, which is what the phones, which is what the internet, which is what TV provides. I can always flip the channel. I can, my focus is always changing. I'm looking at different things all the time. Um, and then, so we are all losing a bit of our ability to attend to certain things. And if we take this, these bits of period, these periods of time to focus on our breathing, on our, on our body, that we will be able to train attention just like we would be able to train a muscle or a skill exactly. or um, any of the other things so basically why why we're bringing this up is the scorecard 10 minute focused breathing um, does much more than just help you calm yourself down and help you bring yourself to a better state of mind or helps it, it does more than to prepare you for the day it actually does things that can help you be more attentive in your work bouts in your learning bouts in your social um, experiences and just overall more attentive more focused lifestyle absolutely um, i really do also think that this uh this particular study helps us understand the training aspect of our attention and how you can actually use that in your everyday life, whether you're sitting down for a meeting or having a conversation with somebody, you know, you can use that selective attention or that folks attention to give that person your entire attention or to give that exercise or workout your entire focus or to give, you know, for instance, if you're working on a business to give that section of your business the entire focus that you need without getting distracted and i know we're all victims of this because especially with like moving to work from home or like work working in your own interpersonal space it's so easy because there's nobody sitting there over your shoulder like hey don't do that or hey don't do that um for you to get lost and lose 10 15 20 minutes uh and then you're like looking up at the screen and now you don't know what's going on or like now you're kind of lost in translation so it allows you to give those longer periods of 
focused attention to actually do deliberate action or deliberate tasks. Um, and I've actually found this very helpful for me as a sole business owner um, and an entrepreneur. You know, I have to sit down and write my own emails or build my own marketing plans or build my own business plans and look at my financials and, you know, contact different companies about manufacturing or whatever that looks like. And, you know, it's so easy for my attention to get divided and straight. And it takes me away from the purpose of what I'm trying to sit there and do. And I don't have, you know, 18 hours in a day to sit down and do work tasks that I need to do. I need to do them, accomplish them in one to two hours um, because that's the amount of time that I've allotted for that specific thing. So I really have to, if I give focused attention, the margin of things that I can complete is much greater than if my attention is constantly being divided or distracted or things like that. And I really like using um, Huberman's, you know, 90 minute rule. So like if you can sit down and do something for 90 minutes, that is, you know, the ideal maximum uh, attention giving. And then you can take a break after that and you can set like a little in between reset. Um, and I like to really sit down and take 90 minutes and do, you know, my marketing plan or take 90 minutes and do my social media for my company or whatever that looks like uh, and map it out and map out my weeks and my month and blah, blah, blah. blah. So can be really beneficial using that training, that time to train your mind, to train your body, to have that build that interpersonal interceptive awareness uh, as to having top down control of what you're trying to do uh, can be very beneficial. So thanks for that study, Lex. Yeah. And then so before we change it, this, the name of the study, if you're trying to do research on your own and look it up, is Improvement of Intention in Elementary School Students Through Fixation Focus Training Activity by Yi Jung Lei, or Lai, forgive me for the pronunciation, and Kang Ming Chang um, from the University of ooh, the, the Wu Fang University. Um, this paper was published in Public Health, uh, the Journal of Environmental and Public Health in 2020. So it's a fairly new study, um, which is exciting that we are studying these, these non-sleep, deep rest activities and these things that are helping us build interoception and that interoception can help us in many more facets than we are aware of. Lex, would this, consider, would this be considered an NSDR protocol or like an NSDR study? You know, I, I'm not sure. I mean, it has... It has things that are like NSDR, but then it has this dynamic moving component as well. Yeah. But I don't know if you've ever done some NSDR. Um, like, did you ever try? Yeah, did you ever try the YouTube video I sent you though? That was made by Andrew Huberman. I don't think he's the voiceover. I think one of his students is, but it came out of his lab, and. It's a lot of stuff like that. Like you'll be sitting there and I'll be like, okay, now please direct your attention to the name of the body part that I say um, and just go along with it. And it'll go like right hand, right thumb, second finger, third finger. And you're just like sit laying there not doing anything and you're just like bringing your attention to it. And then you go through all that. And so um, that's about a 25 minute one that I really like. And I think it's helped me a lot in, in terms of keeping my focus, in terms of finding a more relaxed state faster or finding a more alert, alert state faster. Uh, yeah. Just, just by going through the techniques and understanding what the technique is and how, how it works has really helped. Knowledge of knowledge. Knowledge of knowledge. It really helps you make good decisions. All right, cool. So moving on to uh, the study that I had. Um, ironically, they're both on breathing. Um, the study that I pulled up was from the Frontier of Psychology, uh, and it's called <clears> – <throat> it was published in 2017 from – ooh, there's a lot of authors on here, and they're all Asian. I'm going to destroy these words, these names. Uh, Xiao Ma and Zikui Yeo. Um, those are the two main authors. Uh, and it's called The Effects of Diaphragmatic Breathing on Attention, 
negative effects on stress and healthy adults. If you can present some of those figures, I don't know if you can uh, screen share uh, that. Let me see. So basically the way that this study happened, um, they took 20 or sorry, 40, uh, 40 people and they made two groups. There was a control group with 20 females and 10 males. And then there was a breathing intervention group, uh, which was 10 males and 10 females. Um, so they were randomly selected and the people who went through a breathing intervention group, they did an intensive training of 20 sessions over an eight week period. And each session of training was probably around uh, 30 to 20 minutes. Um, and what they did was, is they created a baseline. So they basically told the contestants what the, what the study was about. Um, it wasn't a blind study. Uh, and they kind of told them what they were going to be covering. And with the intervention group, they gave them actual like breathing courses and coaches. And then with the control group, they just told them what the study was about and then kind of allowed them the post, the, sorry, the baseline test and then the post test. Uh, and the things that they were covering were, or the things that they were trying to measure were amount of cortisol in the system, ability to have, have sustained attention. So kind of like co-tailing on what Alexi was talking about. And then the effects of diaphragmatic breathing on overall health um, in a healthy adult. So real quick, diaphragmatic breathing is using our diaphragm to inhale all of our air and exhale all of our air. Correct. Um, Correct. So then, think about it as like, if I'm sitting here breathing normally, I'm only using a small percentage or the only the bare minimum percentage of my diaphragm in order to keep me alive. Uh, and I'm actually able to take in a lot more air than what my uh, normal resting heart rate would require. Uh, and the healthier you are, the lower that rate is, you know, the unhealthier you are, the more of your diaphragm you have to use in order to breathe. Um, so yes, diaphragmatic breathing is the focus of exhaling all of the oxygen and then inhaling all of the oxygen to basically maximize the amount of airflow that's going into your lungs and then CO2 that's coming out of your lungs. Yeah. And then, um, just for clarity, that's why I'm asking. And no, yeah, absolutely. 20, um, the 20 sessions in between were the 15 minutes of breathing regularly in a relaxed state and then the 15 minutes of diaphragmatic breathing. Yes. In, in the protocol that whatever coach or instructor was directing them to breathe in, correct? So uh, it's just made – it sounds like 20, 20 training sessions – is 20 training sessions on this breathing 15 minutes of relaxed state of breathing in a relaxed state and then 15 minutes of breathing through the diaphragm in a diaphragmatic where i think they're inhaling as much as they can and then they're slowly exhaling for as long as they can correct correct and kind, and of, then kind of after, their own rate. after each session um they were given a series of tests so the first one was, and I don't know if it was, let me see. I don't think, no, I think it was just the pre and post. So before they started the study, they did a series of baseline tests. Um, the first one was to measure cortisol levels uh, in each of the adults. And then the other two were, one was a kind of like a Likert scale. It was called the positive and negative effect scale uh, or the PANIS test. And then the other one was called a number cancellation test, which is measuring for attention. Um, and so after the eight weeks course and the 15 minutes of rested breathing and the 15 minutes of abdominal uh, diaphragmatic breathing, they then re-examined um, these baseline tests. Uh, they tested for cortisol levels using, you know, technology. The standard. The yeah. standard probably cortisol cortisol procedures. tests, and I think they're actually the tests are named in here. Um, and then it's they probably did, a blood test, I would assume. Yeah, and then they did a PENIS test, and then the NCT, the number cancellation test. Um, and what they found was actually pretty interesting, and kind of like 
suggested what I mean the reasons why we're doing this. They found that the about ability for the adults to breathe in like the the breathing intervention group had a much lower rate of cortisol in the bloodstream um, over the eight weeks course than the control group did. And then the performance on the exams that they were able to do, the breathing control group had an increase in performance that was much greater than the control group. Um, and there are figures here, respiratory frequency, and then I can let me see if I can share my screen. I like I think figures present. Figure four and figure five are the are the best ones. And show them the table. Is that a table? Can you see figure my screen one. Now? Uh yes I can. All right, cool. That's weird. There you go. You see now? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So all right, so this one. is basically figure one, which is you had the 40 control group. They went over the diaphragmatic survey, then they randomized, they randomly selected everybody. So this was kind of the baseline test. And then 20 would go in this group, 20 would go in this group. Then they examined the baseline NCT PANAS test and then the cortisol test. The breathing intervention group then sustained 20 sessions over eight weeks of 15 minute rested breathing, and then 15 minute abdominal breathing. And then after the eight weeks period, they redid all of the baseline tests and then the scores were taken and they created statistical averages that came up with some conclusions. So then we'll scroll down here. Here is the difference in age and years, just so you know, it's a pretty. Yeah, it, it seems all pretty equal. Yeah, it's not the like they're, they're testing like 80 year old guys versus like 19 year old kids. Yeah. Um, this is the diaphragmatic breathing respiratory rate in each breathing diaphragmatic breathing a session. Yeah. So this is this is here right here that is the mean of the control group. So this is how many re uh, breaths. No, no, I think that's just the experimental group. Only. Are you sure? Yeah. Because and then because it's it's their twenty sessions, so it's all twenty of their sessions, and then so their mean breathing rate when they're resting, and then their mean breathing rate when they're doing the diaphragmatic breathing. Uh, okay, okay. You get it. So like they, and and that makes sense because they're at nine point nine five in the diaphragmatic breathing, which is long like less breathing compared to their normal resting breathing which is 15 breaths probably per minute, I would say. Yeah. Is probably what they're doing it by. Or nine breaths per minute. We'll show the average of respiratory rate four times each minute diaphragmatic breathing conditions of, okay, 17 minutes. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Sweet. And then down here Keep is going. the respiratory frequency. So this is like how the diaphragmatic breathing decreased the total all levels of breaths per minute. Yeah. And the breaths breathing. per, what does he say? Yeah. Go ahead. And then this is the testing scores. For the negative effect? Yeah. I'm so not this, sure what the negative effect was. I didn't really read too uh, I mean, I think in the in the P P whatever P Penas test, um, it yeah, basically it just is. it basically just asks a series of questions. Um, you know, how are you feeling? Yada yada yada. And then this is the first session, the last session. So their scores went down. But I'm not sure exactly what that was measuring. PA baseline final detected. Positive. Keep going though. Okay. Keep going to the next ones, and I'll I'll try to find this real quick. And then here is the test scores for the it's the not uh, number cancellation test. So basically, they were given a sheet and they were given an uh, amount of time, and there was numbers and symbols that they had to cancel out. 
And so it was basically testing for attention and ability to focus given a time under task or task under time. Um, and so as you can see, Alexi and I were discussing this earlier. We think that both uh, groups increased uh, just because they were able to like do it one, the first time and they had certain scores and then they were able to do it a second time. So they now knew like what the test was going to be like. But you can see a much sharper increase in the breathing intervention group. Uh, and we think that that was due to their ability to focus more or have lower levels of cortisol in their system. So they were able to like process things much quicker um, without being frantic or freaking out. And then this is, oh, so they did salivary cortisol tests. So that's how they were able to get their okay. cortisol levels. Um, nice. So cortisol concentration, as you can see in the breathing control group, the first session, this was their average. And then this is what it came down to. And then actually cortisol levels in the non-intervention group or the control group actually went up a little bit from the last this is session. pretty interesting. I wonder why it went up just a little, even if it was just a little bit. Cool. So that is that. I'll finish this presentation. Sweet. Um, so that's the importance of deep breathing as a protocol or creating non-sleep deep rest um, protocols. And those are just two studies that we found quite interesting as to why. Uh, and it's important that people understand, you know, controlling your breath. Yes, it's a very bottom up biological behavior. But if you give it top down attention, you can actually see a lot of biological benefits um, instantly over time, uh, instantly and over time. And I think that that's the most important highlight or takeaway from what we were trying to present with the studies. Yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's, there's scientific backed inform or back data on these things that are trying to provide to you and, um, and share with you and, and just, it's, we're just trying to get you to believe in it yourself. So that way you're more likely to adhere to it because it is for your benefit. And then, so right. I found one more study. Go ahead. What were you going to say? I was going to say that we we're going to add, we we're going to end up adding these studies to the protocol scorecards so that if you yep. guys want to like, if you ever get added to the protocol scorecards, you can look at these studies, um, read through them, understand the methods and protocols, uh, and then understand the reasons why they're beneficial. Um, again, you know, going back to my study that I did, the effects of diaphragmatic breathing, uh, it affected a lot more than just cortisol levels. It actually affected, you know, in, increased attention levels and also, you know, showed signs of being able to perform uh, and have better effects over, like, overall mental health. Uh, and I think that that's another state, like, something that we are subtly highlighting and subtly finding in our own lives that are beneficial to everybody else. Um, and if you can be in a better all, overall state of mind, you know, the fact that you can control yourself or not freak out or, you know, have more top down control of your own life will over, over the long term be better off um, because you'll be a more optimal version of yourself. Exactly. And then, so I just have one study about, um, our eye biology um and so one of the things on the scorecard is light viewing and um you want to present to, um yeah i only have the access to the abstract i will present it um if i can right. send it to me i got it oh well i think we're presenting now oh you are presenting sick yeah oh. okay what's up dude so you can see that? Yeah. Okay. So um, basically we talk about light viewing and how it helps us to set our circadian clock. So this study, photon capture and signaling by melanopsin retinal ganglion cells. These are the cells that um, are um, the ones in charge of controlling 
or the ones that are reacting to the light that we are getting in the morning or the evening. And these and are going to so, be in your optic nerve, correct? Yeah. So a subset of retinal ganglion cells has recently been discovered to be intrin intrinsically photosensitive with melanopsin as the pigment. So most of the retinal cells in our eyes are for vision. But if you keep reading, these, uh, these cells have been found to have more of um, a response to just light in general. Um, and then so how well they signal intrinsic light absorption to drive behavior remains unclear, but it is it oh, it's the sentence before, um, for non image forming visual functions as such as the pupillary light reflex and circadian photo entertainment. Okay, so these are the cells that are responsible for this setting our circadian clock and this is why we want light in the morning and in the evening and throughout the day the more light data we can get into our eyes um, will help us build a stronger circadian rhythm a stronger circadian clock right so it's like i mean whenever we do any type of study you want more data points the more data points you have uh, the more reliable the information is and the more we trust said study or said block of data and so it's the same for our eyes and these melanopsin cells that the more data that they we can get them the more visual light we can get them throughout of the day sorry the more outside light we can get throughout the day higher lux um i don't know if it talks about lux in here uh, i don't think it does but this journal is found in Nature, which is one of the best journals out there. It's definitely top three. Um, and if you want to do more research, I think I'm going to rent this one later so I can read more of it. But And I, and I think the biggest, the biggest takeaway from this um, paper that you pulled up, Alexi, is the fact that our, our eyes can actually determine the difference between low-angled light in the morning and the evening versus direct sunlight, which is like yep. light at its peak, basically, um, yep. or like noon light. Um, and in your body via evolution and biology and these optic nerves and these melanopsin, I'm not even saying them correctly, melanopsin, um, photo pigment sensitive, light sensitive nerves in the retinal nerve, uh, basically can determine, hey, this is morning light. This is peak light. This is evening light. And, and so, I think I think it's more and uh, it's less like because when we say low angle, it's hitting the atmosphere farther away. So it's less light is getting through the atmosphere because it has to travel through more, you know. So it's like think about it. Think about it more. Think about it like a light. prism. It's kind of refracting some of the light. So like exactly if it, if it hits the atmosphere because the atmosphere is, you know, different uh, layers, if you will, of yeah. atmospheric pressure, which means there's different molecules in there, it's going to refract some of that light. So not all of the photons are going to enter. Yeah. And, and then, so, and, or, or going to hit our eyes. And or going to so hit our eyes. I think our eyes recognize less light, like a little bit of light, but less than midday, which is a lot of light, a lot of light, a lot of light. And then, okay, now it's less light, less light, less light, less light. And the more time you spend outside, the more data your eyes are getting. Okay, it's morning, it's morning, it's morning, it's middle of the day, it's super bright, it's super bright. Okay, the light's starting to fade. Let's start setting Releasing the Releasing melatonin in the body. The setting the stage for sleep you know, yeah. and let's start sure. cooling the core temperature down, yep. which is another reason why the sauna is so good is because it, people think it's, uh, I mean, I definitely think it's kind of backwards where it's like, I want to get in the sauna to cool my core temperature down. You know, it's like the sauna heats me up, but what it does is you're, the sauna heats you up so much that as soon as you get out, your body wants to dump all that heat. And then, so it's just trying to dump and dump and dump. And because it's dumping all the heat, it's setting the stage for cooling the body because as you start to get ready for bed, you, you just want to dump, dump more heat, heat anyways. You already dump heat anyways. So you're start like you put you you set this process already by getting in the sauna and then getting out. And they say even cold sauna, then cold plunge, 
or sorry, cold sauna, warm sauna, then cold, cold plunge. It will really help you set the stage for sleep and help you start getting more into the sleep cycle. So light sensitivity and then sauna or light viewing at night and then sauna and then uh, just doing a couple other things, eating more starchier foods will probably will help you feel more lethargic and kind of like there's there's things you can do to help set the stage for for sleep yeah what is that it that gets released in in when you eat carbohydrates at night is it glycine glycine oh glycine uh, basically there's no. a there's a chemical inside carbohydrates that your body is a byproduct of what your body breaks down i'm not sure exactly what the name of it is that releases melatonin so when you eat carbohydrates towards the end of the day, it releases. I don't know melatonin. if it directly releases to melatonin. I wouldn't want to quote. It's you something in the. It's something in the Ganges nerve. It's in the. It's in the Ganges or vagus nerve. The vag, the vagus, but it's de- there's definitely yeah, the vagus something the going like, on. The vagus is the one that's connected to the gut. The vagus is like a spider web that's connected to all organs. And that's like a, and that's like, like if you listen to the human lab about emotions, uh, he talks about like the vagus is the window to the emotions because basically our emotions are, are all of our organs speaking to our nervous system and like letting them know their individual states and then our vagus and nervous system compile all that and then that's what our mood is, you know, and it's like that's why eating right is so valuable to your to your mood and exercising and making sure your heart rate's not too high or too low and like taking care of all these things all your organs not drinking too much alcohol and destroying your liver kind of things like they it's really vital to your mood because your mood is not like some conscious thought or like thing that we create or that or something that's created from our outside environment it's actually our reaction to our outside environment and if we think about it as a reaction to what's going on outside of us hopefully that gives you the liberation to feel like you can control your emotions a little bit better because it's how we react to things so it's like when i'm feeling really stressed out if i do some breathing techniques i can slow my heart rate down i can um, do a whole number of things that will help me kind of be i guess less emotional towards whatever stimulus is coming my way absolutely all right cool before we get too sidetracked <laughs> well, yeah um, i know yeah no we could sit here and talk about bro i'm absolutely fascinated by like all these things and i wish like i part of me wants to go back to school just to study biology and like to study anatomy and the physiology behind like a human body because it's absolutely fascinating and the more i learn like the more i want to learn and i hope that everybody embarks in this journey of understanding their own body so that they can become better versions of themselves enter salience project where we're just trying to pique your interest and try to experiment with your everyday lifestyle so that you can you know try to get you excited try to get you excited about experimenting with your everyday lifestyle exactly because i know i'm having a, a good time i'm having fun like trying new things and just experimenting with with uh, with my lifestyle, and and uh, it seems to be paying dividends in doing so. And um, I guess only the future will tell if it's really working or not. But we would like all of you to join us on this journey that Alec and I have endeavored on, um, and we look forward to continuing enhancing everyone's knowledge as best Absolutely. as we can. Okay. All right, so but, that's we're about sixty minute mark. Um, is there anything you'd like to close with? No, I think that's it. We're um, about sixty minute mark. I see. Is that Champions League in the corner? Yeah, man. You know, I got the PSG game on. So. Champions League in the corner. So, for everybody that's been joining in, tuning in with us, thank you so much. Um, it's really been an honor to be able to uh, share with you guys our little bits of experience and our little bits of excitement um, that we're dealing with or that we're like fostering in our lifestyle. And we hope that we can share and do the same. Um, Yeah. Feel free to like, share, comment, do whatever you got to do in order to pass this information on, whether you find it valuable, please go do your own research post in our group. Uh, We're going to have a group here soon. So post in our group, just join the community 
be amazing. And we hope to hear from you guys soon. Peace. Aliens Project out. Next week, hey, we might be doing, we might be two doing, weeks. Yeah, okay. In two weeks, we might be doing a uh, special edition Aliens Project. So stay tuned for that. Yeah, that would be sick. They ain't ready for that. <laughs> They're not ready for that. I don't know if I'm ready for that either. <laughs> yeah, I don't know either. We might not be too salient at that point. All right, Lex. Take it easy, All bro. Right. Have a good day. Peace. Yeah, you too. Peace. Peace.